So our guest today is Jenna Cowan, MP for Fredericton, which includes a large area around Fredericton, but the writing is called Fredericton. So thanks for taking the time, Jenna I'm excited to be back. <laughs> so you're still bright and cheery after a campaign, and yeah. that's good, and you start off on a new direction. What's the first thing that struck you about your new shift in life direction? Um, I mean, I, I mentioned it kind of feels a little bit like the campaign still, just as far as the pace. Yeah. Um, but it was really incredible to go do my orientation and to just experience all of the, um, you know, the organization. And I was really, you know, impressed by the House of Commons staff and how well they looked after us, um, your own liaison officer to make sure you're settling in nicely. Um, and I, I did a tour of Parliament as well, which was just, uh, it was quite emotional because I'd never done it before. So it's uh, all its all new to me. <laughs> you're rookie through and through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, that that leads to an interesting thing. Most people don't fathom that Joe Q public or Joe Q citizen can run for office and win and then land up in Ottawa at the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. You kind of represent that journey. Um, America has their version of it that anybody could become president, which, of course, that myth is like blown. <laughs> <long enough. laughs> yeah. But in, in Canada, you know, someone from a community um, can actually end up being part of the decision making process. Mm -hmm. So what was your first impression of all of that, seeing as you were um, brand new to going through the House of Commons? And, and is it overwhelming? Is it intimidating? Is it, ah, I got this? Um, I mean, I'm just, I'm just so excited by it all. So and I, I do think, you know, I feel quite confident um, in my abilities and I'm a very fast learner. Um, and I'm just so inspired by it all that I'm, I'm so committed to, to working hard and doing what it takes to succeed. And so um, it's been great. And really, so we had our first caucus booting as well, which was very exciting. Um, and I kind of joke we were supposed to be in, um, in Confederation Building, where Elizabeth's office is. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, all the pizza places were closed on a Sunday. So we needed to, to go to a restaurant and have our first caucus meeting in a restaurant. <laughs> um, but I really liked it because it was quite relaxed. And, uh, you know, we're, I'm from the East Coast, so that really helps <laughs> yeah. when you're settling in. So it was great. And just to, to learn from Elizabeth and, and Paul Manley and, and their team, it was just... Uh, it's really exciting and energizing. So one of the first things that comes up after an election, and given that Fredericton um, did vote green, mm -hmm. um, comment on the street would be something along the lines of, oh, now we're screwed. Because <laughs> we've got this one person kind of isolated in this little pocket tucked over here, mm -hmm. and everybody else kind of voted this way. Mm -hmm. The West, of course, voted like the West does. Mm -hmm. Side note, a squirrel, squirrel moment. Um, that pattern is not unusual. Same thing happened in the 80s. Um, some people actually did some homework to see, oh, this is the first time Western alienation, but no, mm, this, yeah. we've been through this before. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you address those people who think that um, they've made a mistake or a mistake has been made mm. because there's one green little pocket over here and then there's another one over there? And How do you address that? I want to give you some space to kind of get them to see what you see. Yeah, and I mean, part of it I, I addressed even in my uh, my speech on election night. It was is that you know, regardless if you voted for me or not, I'm going to work so hard for everyone in the constituency, and I, I want to to prove to them that it's not a mistake. Mm. Um, and I think that just continue to reach out to across demographics, um, to so many different organizations and different groups, and just to, to make those connections. So we did such a great job of that throughout the election campaign, but there's so much more to do. There are so much many more people I didn't get to connect with. And I think once mm. I connect with them, um, they'll start to see that doing things differently or being that um, you know, little speck of green is is a good thing. So it brings that diversity. It brings a different perspective. Um, and I talked a little bit about that excitement and energy. And I think we need a little bit of that right now. Um, mm. Some of that positivity and some of the the negativity and the darkness that we're seeing. Mm. Um, even when, with respect to the the Western alienation and some of the things that are happening, it's uh, if I can provide a little bit of hope and inspiration, even to those who who might think that I'm inexperienced or that it was a mistake made. Um, I think that I can win them over, and I'm I'm very confident in my abilities to do that. I want to tweak this a little bit. Um, the mistake made wasn't you personally. The mistake made was strategically. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. the traditional voter tends to think we have to vote for the party in power because then they can get money back to our riding. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be a, a team of one for Atlantic Canada. Yeah. Um, so you spoke directly to the difference between representation and being in power, mm -hmm. that culture of being in power. It would be interesting to watch over the next four years as you do your work um, for people to start to catch on that in general terms there needs to be a shift away from that culture of being in power mm -hmm. to a governance model. Mm -hmm. Does it kind of make sense? 
It does, yeah. I was, I was trying to give you some space there so that th those people, those citizens can can change that there's a different way of governing or mm -hmm. a different way of doing politics. Well, and there's already been um, some talk around, let's say, uh, the Performing Arts Center or uh, the Aquatic Center that we're looking to, to build here in the city. And uh, I was interviewed um, by the media and just on, on what I think I can do to bring funding in. And, and certainly that's part of this learning process. I need to understand the yeah. bilateral agreements and, and how funding comes into the region. Um, and so, but, you know, we already had some some comments by uh, some political science professors that, that said, well, we've got a green MP, we've got a, a blue province, we've got a red minority government, that there's going to be no money coming into the region. So I, I just I refuse to believe that that's how we arbitrarily uh, fund things throughout the, the country. Yeah. So um, I'm just, again, looking forward to dispelling <laughs> any of those yeah, yeah. potential myths. And, and you can't say this, but I can say this. I just want to smack those people side of the head <laughs> sometimes, you know, because because they're controlling the narrative mm -hmm. and they're keeping it stuck in the same old box. Mm -hmm. And they're working on the premise that MPs are elected based on their ability to bring money into a constituency. Yes. Which that's not the job. That's a part of the job, mm -hmm. but it's not the job. It always fascinated me watching uh, in past uh, elections, watching candidates promote themselves based on dollar figures. Mm -hmm. I remember two elections past, I think. I can't remember the candidate and I'll protect them by forgetting. <laughs> and, and um, you know, the piece of paper that comes through, the flyers that keep coming through, um, it was literally dollars, um, ch ch chunk of change, ch this item, chunk of change, this item, chunk I'm thinking, but your job is so much bigger than doing that. And mm -hmm. the community's prosperity or the community's well-being or access to federal funds shouldn't be dependent on voting for the party in power. Mm. Um, so you got an interesting challenge in front of you in the House of Commons or whatever, you know, 90% of the work happens outside of there. Mm -hmm. um, trying to make sure that um, Fredericton g gets its share, which is a weird phrasing. It's just that we can keep going the way we need to keep going. Mm -hmm. To make it an issue-specific thing, um, media gave you some coverage the other day about the glyphosate stuff. And, you know, Green Party MP wants to try to ban glyphosate. Mm -hmm. Most people on the outside would see that as a pretty good uphill battle. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people who read a fair amount or do some homework will see that it's something that needs to be done and should have been done ages ago, which puts us right into New Brunswick's you know, greatest tension, basically. Mm. Jobs and um, the way things are done industrially to a whole new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Green technology, new green deal, that, that stuff. Can you, um, I'm assuming media might not have given you much space to really go deep on what it was you wanted that. So how, how are we going to work together to ban glyphosate in New Brunswick? Well, I mean, so one of the approaches I can take is is hoping to, to kind of win the lottery as far as getting to pre present a private member's bill. Um, in a minority government situation, we know that it has to be within 1 to 100 rather than the 338 to get your opportunity to present the bill. Um, so that's one of the levers that I'm going to look into. Um, there's already been a whole lot of work done on this. So I'm certainly not, uh, yeah. you know, pioneering this by any sense of the word. Yeah. Um, so You're it's the connecting. Point person. Well, yeah, so exactly, I'm using this platform to help those who have, you know, dedicated so much time and effort to this, um, because it does mean a lot to a lot of people, um, and it is such an important issue for New Brunswick, but it, it, it's a Canadian issue as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just in general, we need to look at our, our pesticide and herbicide uses and those impacts on our health. And I know that there have been studies, I know that it's been officially deemed as safe, but I just don't, uh, I don't um, buy it. <laughs> I've, I've, um, I've done two or three shows on that. Uh, Dr. Thierry Vrain was in okay. three summers ago. Um, his show is like in the 20 or 30,000 views, which is pretty cool. Um, he's an expert on your gut mm. and the impact of glyphosate on your gut. He didn't want to get into the politics, but he did answer one key question, which is uh, some scientists, usually on the industry side, say that uh, this stuff breaks down and, and it's good. It's like um, benign when, it, when it's all broken down. Mm. Vrain will tell you what it does to your microbiome in your gut because it enters the water streams, enters food systems, and then, you know, three years later it appears somewhere in your gut and mm. changes your gut chemistry. Um, what they were missing, of course, were the 30 or 40 year long term studies that can validate this, you know, as an um, indicator of cancer and a few mm -hmm. other health issues. But you're going to still have that challenge with what do you replace it with? You know, so glyphosate was used originally because it's a cost effective way mm -hmm. of maintaining power lines as clear, um, um, certain kind of forest management strategies for some people. Mm -hmm. What takes its place? I think it's hiring human beings to do that work. I think that it, it's what a beautiful way to 
open up a sector that also connects people to the land. So it's spending a lot of really valuable time outdoors um, and doing something that's really meaningful and that is necessary. And mm. there's there's work to be done there. So it's in this. We're talking about cost savings. I'm certain it would probably cost more to hire individuals, but there's still millions of dollars being put into the fun, the funding for the spray itself. So it's. I think it's really about. Um, I think a holistic approach to looking at the benefits and it's mm. more to me there's a human benefit um, if we look at you know hiring people to do that work instead um, you know I lived on a power line as a kid I know I'm I've been wondering what kind of effects are going to be down the line for me um, I've been given lots of information I know uh, BC there's a, a city there that, that passed a resolution that based on its effects on the eyes as well or there's there's different um, links to you know again cancers and I know it's it's tough to say that because our official stance in Canada is that it's safe but we can't ignore what's happening in the United States where there's now precedent set for, for court cases for, you know, yep. a lifetime of use that's led to cancer. So it's very scary. And, and I think that's really what we're looking for in New Brunswick is let's take the less risky roads for once. We seem to always have um, this option before us that's filled with a lot of risks, but the alternative is that there's no jobs or it's going to cost us more money. But that can't be how we hmm. decide things moving forward. Hmm. Do you have any thoughts about money? I'm trying to dig down to some of those common denominators. So thanks for sliding into an issue specific. Mm -hmm. um, no one expects you to suddenly become an expert on like a thousand different <laughs> things because you're going to be asked to I think talk. some people do expect <laughs> me that. <laughs> you know, like the, the, the unrealistic uh, mm -hmm. expectations. Now you can be team building mm -hmm. so that you can create um, this, this network mm -hmm. that because politicians often um, cliche or generalizing. But they'll, they'll kind of work to the angles that they want in order to get reelected, rather mm -hmm. than the greater good angle, which maybe it's finally coming full circle that the greater good is how you're going to get reelected, because people will start to see the benefits. They just can't see the way that that happens mm -hmm. yet. Um, they want to believe it, but they don't know how. Yeah. Money sits as a root underneath all that. Um, so I'm sure some people, as you were just talking, are thinking, yeah, how are we going to pay for all that? Once upon a time, the civil culture program in New Brunswick was like two or three times the size that it currently is. Mm -hmm. But it was citizens who put pressure on government to reduce the size of government. So that's one of the programs that got cut, and then it gets replaced with something else. Mm -hmm. So general thought about money is, um, do we have enough money? It, does Canada have enough money? Does New Brunswick have enough money? That we just need to kind of rearrange it and not sort of store it or aim it in these directions, but actually move it this way. And things that pop up would be hiring more for the civil culture program, guaranteed annual income, that kind of mindset, um, funding voluntary sector a whole different way so it stabilizes the workforce there, mm -hmm. which deliver the services. You want to play with, with money? Is mm -hmm. there enough money? I think there is. Um, so a lot of my career has been about navigating federal systems to bring money in um, for different programs. I know that there's there's lots of money, and I think that it is about just how we prioritize and reorient and, and switch our mandates. And that's really the challenge, I think, um, again, being one of three greens is like, you know, what kind of impact can I have to really push that that reorientation? But I again, I believe that I can, you know, at least have an impact. Um, and that's the question we get asked all the time is how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it. The same way we've been paying for it as a government system, it's just about restructuring. Um, and so, and, and it's the same with New Brunswick. I mean, we, we obviously do have, there are deficits, there are, you know, national debts, but uh, it's just about ensuring that we're, we're heading down the right direction and we're seeing, again, those cost benefits and we're looking, I think, in general towards wellness and our future and what that really means. And that's that's been about, um, you know, my personal mission, I think, in, in anything that I do is how is this going to affect the general well-being of the individuals around me? And I think what a really nice way to, to think about politics instead of it being based specifically on, on the dollars. Um, but I, I, I've talked about it before that I really think we don't have to pit um, the two against each other. We don't have to pit economy and environment as an example. It, it all goes hand in hand, mm. but we have to get everyone on the same page. And that's, I think, the difficult work. Uh, we're talking a little bit about Western alienation. You know, the, the need for unity in Canada, I think, is should be our number one priority at this moment. And, you know, you might be, you know, climate change obviously has to be a concern. Healthcare here in New Brunswick, those are things that I've prioritized as well. But if we don't have that unity piece, I don't see how we're going to, you know, take any steps forward, any meaningful steps forward. And so uh, we've got to figure out a way to, to connect with one another, to build those bridges and find our common ground um, and get this get this done for Canada. Um, so it's, it really should be about well-being and wellness. Yeah. One of those shifts that can occur on Canadian unity is if we can change our narrative about money. Mm. So it's like a personal journey. When you recognize you have everything you need, you can get on with 
doing things. Mm -hmm. If you're spending all your time thinking you don't have enough, I need more, I need more, mm -hmm. you tend to stay stuck in the same place. The whole bit about Western alienation or Quebec separation, I'm, I'm old enough to live through the Quebec crisis and all that stuff. To me, it's one of the great Canadian paradoxes. Mm. It is us. That conversation is us. So, of course, the West is going to do what it does. It's part of our history. We can go back, you know, 200 years on that, more mm -hmm. or less now. Mm -hmm. um, so, just to sit comfortably in the contradiction or in the paradox is one of the great strengths I've always felt. <laughs> the other country is like, yeah. <laughs> so, they're going to base their economy on a single industry and watch it go up and down. Well, that's good, but the country doesn't need to follow mm -hmm. that. But at the same time, we do need to nurture everybody's well-being, just like Atlantic Canada and... and resources we have or we don't have and the scale we have or don't have and it needs a different model than the industrial model um, mm. to, to do so. Beldoon closes <clears throat> and the first thought is to stick another anchor industry in there and solutions have been provided over the past 50 years on community-based um, economically driven strategies that mm -hmm. the community's in charge of not we're gonna plunk this in. So you sit in the middle of trying to shift the narrative Mm -hmm. And three of you, you're going to have to be pretty loud. Well, and it doesn't just have to be three of us as well. So I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to getting to know my other New Brunswick MPs, um, the other Atlantic Canadian MPs, but also, you know, across party lines. I, I want to make friends. I want to build those relationships. Um, there's lots of things that uh, we, we share common ground with. So um, just as an example, uh, Jaime Batiste from uh, Nova Scotia, we kind of bonded during our orientation and, you know, he's, he's a liberal and I think that we really align on so many things. And so I've got, I've got a friend there. And mm -hmm. so it's going to be about that. Um, and, and there's many NDPs across Canada as well who have talked you know very strongly about their their commitment to, to climate change action um to things like uh protecting you know reproductive rights or focusing on health care pharma care all of these things are just you know you know so important to them as well and so it's about finding those people and linking arms and saying how can we do this together because the beauty of that minority government situation is that we can do that and we can be firm in our in our beliefs and represent our constituencies but we can all kind of work in this way to make things uh, function because nobody wants to go back to the polls um, I, even though I know hearing um, uh, Jagmeet Singh mention that they're ready any time to go back to election the, the Canadian people aren't ready mm. nobody wants to do that so it's not even about you know protecting our jobs or anything like that it's just about getting to work but there's just so much to be done and there's no time to waste yeah <clears throat> that again points to a shift in the narrative and a perception from the public. Um, in some ways, and, and I don't like using the language, but it's quickest to get to it. It's, it's quite tribal, right? Mm -hmm. So red, green, mm -hmm. blue, like all that's, it has to be idea based. Mm -hmm. You're speaking to, we can link arms based on having a shared idea and a mm -hmm. shared delivery. Mm -hmm. Think people will buy that because the pushback against that is, y'all, you'll never vote for me because I can't claim I brought this to the constituency. Mm -hmm. You think people are finally ready yet to let go of how they've always voted? Once they start to recognize that a green and a red and an orange work together this way and then another red jumped in and get past the tribal so like all the paint colors get stirred up? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've shown in Fredericton that that can absolutely be done. Um, and it, it should always be about the individual. It should be about that representative that you have, that you really feel that they have your beliefs and your your, your best interests at heart. Mm. Um, and that's how we should always be voting in an election, um, based on their strengths and skills and what they can bring, not in, in terms of money, but in terms of, yeah. of that Ide power. Ideas and partnership. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I, I was pushing it to the next level. So now the House of Commons has to find a way to function. Mm -hmm. Not unlike how New Brunswick's legislature still needs to find a way how to function. Yeah. That's quite exciting. Because it's a change, it's a shift, and mm -hmm. now people have to believe <laughs> that it, it can function because the narrative will always be it's dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. um, mainstream media is forever pushing, it's going to be dysfunctional, it can't work. Mm -hmm. This mindset of power as opposed to governance. Um, We're already hearing a lot of that. Just people just anytime they mention the minority government situation was well, who knows how long it's going to last or election could be any time. Like that, that's very much being yeah. put out there a lot by the media. And so we just need to slow down on that <laughs> yeah or control that narrative because the media tends to control the narrative of course and mm -hmm. and they run off in a direction that's not journalism it's like opinion pieces mm. different mm -hmm. um it happened to you your first day or second day when suddenly you're going to be the next leader of the green party and i'm like what what <laughs> yeah. she's just got her, her feet through a door here yeah. it's like do you understand the workload involved in and it's like oh i, I felt bad for you because now you got to deal with that coming at you mm -hmm. like, 
no. no I mean, it was it was encouraging, <laughs> and I felt you know it was very humbling for so many people to just come out and, and believe that I could potentially be the leader. But uh, absolutely, this is not the right time. Um, I would be, I think, failing my constituency to jump into something like that to have to support other candidates and to travel to other ridings. Also, my children, my family. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we opened the show, and you're talking about going to Ottawa for the first time and seeing the House of Commons. Yes. Like, yeah. So media would know that. So why would they ask you that question? I was like. I want to slap yeah. them inside. The <laughs> Sorry, it's into that. <clears throat> Healthcare. Let's slide into that for a bit, and then we uh, we need to wrap up a bit. So New Brunswick's chewing pretty hard about its own budget. Mm -hmm. um, squirrel moment. There are other ways to get governments out of debt and deficit. It's called a Bank of New Brunswick or public banking. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a shift in ideology, and it's going to take a certain kind of momentum to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But people can't say there aren't solutions out there. Once upon a time, Canada had a Bank of Canada, and we weren't in debt in the early 70s. And then there was pressures to change and do it, you know, globalization and global yeah. economies, and we went in the hole pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, so $2.1 billion for 750,000 people for health care delivery. In your mind, does that sound like enough money for 750,000 people? And and then as your role as MP, um, is it going to be, how do I bring more money in when we get talking about federal transfer payments and you have to represent us? Or is it about reallocating what we have in a different way? Mm, I think we do need more, more money. Um, I think that because it's at such a crisis level and because it's almost broken at this point that it's going to take a little bit of an injection of, of excess funding to make sure that we can find those solutions and in a, a quick turnaround because it, it, people's lives are literally at stake mm -hmm. um, and so it is a little bit about money um, and I know it already you know comprises a, such a huge amount of our budget but I think again it's about wellness and we need to focus on prevention and there's a lot of other wonderful spin-offs if we, we start to go down that road and so um, it doesn't have to be this kind of sink or a, a money pit it's, it should be seen about actually growing and improving um, our health which can also lead to growing the economy so there are so many individuals uh, so many workers who are unable to participate because of their mental health let's say or because um, you know they have a disability that hasn't been looked after in, in the way that they need um, there's there's families that are struggling there's poverty there's addiction so I think it's kind of this again, this holistic kind of view for me that if we if we really go at healthcare hard and we try to fix the, the issues that we're seeing um, and, and the solutions are there, it's not about, you know, research and development. The, the, the experts already know what needs to be done. The people on the ground, the physicians, the nurses, um, they know. And so it's just about empowering them to make those changes. It is, it is about money, I think, at this point. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a personal question. Is there anything that scares you about your new gig? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't want to let anyone down. I okay. think that's that would be the thing that uh, would keep me up at night, <laughs> yeah. because it's just meeting so many incredible individuals along this along the way. So many of the powerful stories at the doors, um, just organizations and seeing what they're doing and what their needs are meeting with kids and feeling their energy and excitement for following an election which was amazing I think for so many of the, the youth in this region hmm. um, I don't want to let them down I want them to see that we can do these things I want them to believe in the change that we've, we've been talking about um, because I believe it and I, I hope that they feel that from me but it's it's about action and I've I've never been someone who uh, has, has spoken about things that I don't intend to follow through on and hmm. so that's really the I don't know if it's it's you know a fear necessarily, but it's certainly something that uh, I, I worry a little bit about. Is you know I, how quickly can I deliver, and I want to keep this momentum and keep everybody excited and mm. and positive because you know there's hard times, and uh, I think that we need a little bit of sunshine. And yeah. uh, if I can bring some of that, uh, I'll be you know that's the legacy that I hope to leave. Hmm. What will feed your soul as you go on this journey? Well, there's there's all kinds of kind of small wins along the way that have been feeding my soul. And I mentioned the, the children and the youth a little bit. Um, but it seems like no matter where I go, even if it's at the grocery store now or, you know, at the gas station or wherever I am, that someone will come up to me and they'll thank me for something or they'll, they'll tell me how uh, I connected with them on a certain issue or, you know, they'll just reach out in such a warm way. And, mm -hmm. and those are the wins. And that's what really feeds my soul. Mm -hmm. The other uh, day through social media, um, 22 Minutes had this video clip, pretty funny about what you guys get paid. Mm -hmm. um, uh, give you a chance for some rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's it's actually important to have those conversations. Yeah. Um, many people probably wouldn't have known, um, you know, what the breakdown is yeah. and where all the... So, so was it accurate to a degree? 
to a degree it was um i think there were some some leaps that they were taking with um uh, you know the way expenses work or the way that um some of the the members uh, office budgets are actually roll out but you know pretty accurate you can find all those numbers online sure. um you also you know, there's we're in a certain tax bracket so we'll be giving out quite a bit <laughs> of that back as we should yeah. um but it's also about you know living in in two places and uh you know but i think I think we do make quite a bit and uh, it's, it is a reflection on our society and how, you know, we're looking at what is the average Canadian sal salary versus what we're making as their representatives. Yeah. And that's, it doesn't really sit well with me. And I've mentioned that before. And uh, I just think that there should be more balance in society. And uh, sure. if we could kind of lead that charge, I don't think anyone will join me in, in that <laughs> kind of conversation, but yeah. there's got to be a way that we can give back more. Um, I think anybody in those kinds of positions that should really be thinking about how can we, how can we balance this out a little bit? And that goes back to money. Um, when you can find the common denominator that crosses all the different topics, you can actually get at a root of a change. So is money to be stored? Like, you know, th these are the salaries. Um, interesting 22 minutes didn't also poke at the billionaires and the millionaires or the offshore funds and, mm -hmm. and all that mm -hmm. stuff, right? Um, but they went right at public servants and, and you guys. Um, but money is also to be distributed. So if we remember the Occupy... Uh, movement, which seems like it's ancient history now, and it wasn't that long ago, mm. and that in income inequality is one of the greatest challenges we have, but it never comes up in the narrative. It always stays stuck on a specific topic, rather than the root of that is that income inequality. Mm. So if we can make money be distributed again, like you were saying about getting MPs to uh, contribute and stuff, mm -hmm. then that changes the model. Just like having, having more people working in civil culture rather than in industrial base. Mm -hmm. It changes the distribution model. Like guaranteed annual income changes mm -hmm. the distribution model. And you talked a little bit about how, you know, that can make people feel and how they're able to participate in society in a way because you can kind of focus on what else is happening rather than just the daily struggle of wondering how you're going to make ends meet. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the other kind of great thing about you know being someone who didn't come from a political background or didn't come from you know whatever the the traditional spaces for a politician might be um, i am just a regular new brunswicker i have struggled just like uh, the, the next person and i think that's an important thing to have moving forward that that in, informs me in a way that i can again really represent individuals and i can speak to these issues um knowing exactly how it feels to be in that position um so i think that's part of that that divide is that there's some people who are just kind of they've been within this this bubble where they just don't you know understand how much their privilege has allowed them to thrive in their life and there are so many individuals who just don't have um you know those those safety networks or you know just that you know breathing room and i think that we can all it's back to wellness again if you have that breathing room if you know you're going to be able to provide enough for your children or for your family um you can be so much more productive and you can dream and you can you can work towards making these kind of big changes yep when john claude basque was on the show from um oh what's the name of his group uh poverty strategy mm. group i'm embarrassed i can't remember his name i just wonder i could remember jean claude he talked about a hundred thousand new brunswickers uh, feel disenfranchised to the degree that they don't even kind of want to go vote mm -hmm. different from those that have jobs and don't want to vote make they just feel so oppressed by systems that they have to deal with and live through in order to get their food that day or to get some place to sleep that day mm -hmm. that the thought of voting is so far away so there needs to be an outreach program and a safety net to help them engage Mm -hmm. So it reinforces what you're talking about. Just a, that's the New Brunswick number, roughly. Yeah. Um, a common front for social justice thing. There, I thought of it. It's on close oh, group. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, so we should start to wrap up a little bit. I, I want to play a touch. So in a perfect world, it's four years from now. And um, you're back here. <laughs> and and you've had four years of doing it from the front end to the, the first cycle through and assuming you're re re-offering and stuff. Mm -hmm. Anything that you want to say today that, you know, if I save the tape and all that, that four years from now we'll look at and go, wow, that's what that was like four years ago. Hmm. Something you'll tell your future self. Usually you ask people about, you know, what could you have told your 18-year-old self? Like, right? <laughs> I so, like that. Uh, that's play, a great play question. It, play it forward. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's just going to be, you know, kind of the old the old adage, hang in there, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's going to be about balance. It's about, you know, again, my family life and how that's going to work. Um, mm. It's about keeping that great team around me um, and, and that navigation piece and just figuring things out and, and knowing that, 
you know, you're, you're going to get the hang of this and, uh, and you will deliver. So it's talking about, you know, that uneasiness about, about not wanting to let people down, but, mm. uh, I, you know, I, I have to believe in myself. And I think that's what the message I'd like to say is you can do this, Jenica. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so to sign off is, uh, you know, thank you for taking the time again. Okay. Um, is there something in your mind as you head off on this journey that you want, um, you want to send as a message to the constituency or to the riding? Mm. Well, I think it, it goes back to that unity piece. I think that we really need to come together um, as New Brunswickers, in, in, you know, in particular, but as Canadians and, you know, even thinking about, you know, to bring up another issue, but what happened with, with Don Cherry? And again, it just seems like we're always pitting, you know, groups against one another or these issues, and it really doesn't have to be like that. Mm -hmm. um, I've always said I'm someone who lives in the gray. There is never kind of this, uh, you know, a binary mm -hmm. situation or a dichotomy. There's always more to the story. So I just, I, I really urge all of us to find a way to connect to one another and to kind of, uh, you know, just bring people together. That's really what we need to do right now. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other.